about uh, how you came to be a pilgrim. What was your state before beginning on this way? Oh, I was much in the enjoyment of all my sins and pleasures, as were all others who dwelt at Vanity Fair. What things were they? All the treasures and riches of the world. Also, I delighted much in rioting, reveling, drinking, swearing, lying, uncleanness, Sabbath-breaking and what not, that tended to destroy the soul. But I found at last, by hearing and considering of things that are divine, which indeed I heard of you and beloved faithful, that was put to death for his faith and good living in Vanity Fair, that the end of these things is death, and that for these things' sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. And did you quickly fall under the power of this conviction? Oh no, I was not willing to know the evil of sin, nor the damnation that follows, but rather tried to shut mine eyes against the light. But what caused you to finally realize that it was the Spirit of God calling you? Well, firstly, I was ignorant that it was God working upon me. I never thought that, by awakening a realization of sin, that God at first begins the conversion of a sinner. Secondly, sin was yet very sweet to my flesh, and I was loath to leave it. Thirdly, I could not tell how to part with mine old companions, their presence and actions being so agreeable unto me. Fourthly, the hours in which conviction were upon me were such troublesome and such heart-affrighting hours that I could not bear them, not even their memory. Then did you sometimes get rid of your convictions? Yes, by many and various means I would try to forget, but they would always return and then I would be as bad off, nay, worse off than I was before. Why? What brought your sins to mind again? Oh, many things. Such as if I did meet with a good man in the streets, or if I but heard any read from the Bible, or if mine head did begin to ache, or if I were told that some of my neighbors were sick, or if I heard the bell toll for some that were dead. Or if I thought of dying myself, or if I heard that sudden death happened to others. But especially, especially when I thought of myself that I must quickly come to judgment. And could you ever get rid of the sense of guilt? No, not at all. For it began to get a tighter hold of my conscience. And then, if my fleshly mind did begin to think of turning back to my sin, even though my heart was dead set against it, it would be double torment to me. So what did you do? Why, I, I thought I must try to mend my life. Or else, thought I, I am sure to be damned. And did you? Oh, yes. I fled not only from my sins, but from sinful company, too, and betook me to religious duties as praying, reading, weeping for sin, speaking truth to my neighbors, and so forth. And did you think yourself well, then? Yes. For a while, but at last my troubled conscience came tumbling upon me again, and that in spite of all my reformations. How so? Since you were now reformed. It was again the reading of the Word of God. There I read such things as these. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. Ah, yes. I remember reading such things myself. Then what? From these sayings, I began to reason with myself thus. If all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and if, by the deeds of the law, no man can be justified, and if, when we have done all, we are yet unprofitable servants, then it is but a folly to think of gaining heaven by the law. Well thought out. Go on. Well, then I thought of this. If a man runs a hundred pounds into the shopkeeper's debt, and afterwards shall repent, and from then on pay for all that he shall buy, yet his old debt doth still stand in the book uncancelled, 
and at any time the shopkeeper may sue him and cast him into the prison till he shall pay him. And how did you apply this to yourself? Like this. I have by my sins run a great way into God's debt, and my now reforming will in no wise pay off that past score. Yea, though I live ever so perfectly, the past is ever there to collect its due, and I have no extra righteousness to expend to my past. A very good application, but do go on. Another thing that did trouble me greatly was that if I looked closely at even the best of my deeds, I found that I was doing them for selfish reasons. Therefore even my good deeds were mixed with sin, enough to find me guilty in the judgment. Then what did you do? Do? <laughs> I could not tell what to do. I was like to give up, till I break my mind to faithful, for he and I were well acquainted. And he told me that unless I could obtain the righteousness of a man that never had sinned, neither mine own nor all the righteousness of the world could save me. And did you believe him? When I was satisfied with my good deeds, I would have called him a fool. But now, since I have seen myself truly, and the sin which joins itself to my best performance, I have been forced to admit that he is right. But did you think that such a man could be found, who had never committed sin? Not at the first, but later, yes. And did you ask him what man this was, and how his righteousness might become your own? Yes, and he told me it was the Lord Jesus. He told me that I might trust in what he had done for me, first by his life, and second by his sufferings upon the cross. Did you ask him how that man's righteousness could be of such a quality that it could justify you before God? Yea, verily. And? He told me that he was the mighty God who had done his noble deeds, not for himself, but for me. He further told me that all his life and deeds should become mine own, if I would but believe on him. And what did you do then? I made myself excuses not to believe, for I thought he was not willing to save one such as I. And how did Faithful answer you? He bid me go to him and see. Then I said it was presumption, but he said, No, for I was invited to come. Then he gave me a book of Jesus' indicting to encourage me the more freely to come. And he said concerning that book that every jot and tittle thereof stood firmer than heaven and earth. Then I asked him what I must do when I came. And he told me I must entreat on my knees with all my heart and soul the Father to reveal him to me. Then I asked him further how I must make supplication to him. And he said, Go. And thou shalt find him upon a mercy seat, where he sits all the year long to give pardon and forgiveness to them that come. I told him that I knew not what to say when I came, and he bid me say to this effect, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and make me to know and believe in Jesus Christ. For I see that if his righteousness had not been, or if I have not faith in that righteousness, I am utterly cast away. Lord, I have heard that Thou art a merciful God, and hast ordained that Thy Son, Jesus Christ, should be the Savior of the world, and moreover, that Thou art willing to bestow His righteousness upon such a poor sinner as I am. And I am a sinner indeed. Lord, Take therefore this opportunity, and magnify thy grace in the salvation of my soul, through thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. A beautiful prayer. And did you then do as you were bidden? Oh, yes. Over and over and over. And did the Father reveal his Son to you? Not at the first, nor second, nor third, or, or fourth, or fifth, no, nor even at the sixth time. What did you do then? Why, I could not tell what to do. Had you no thoughts of leaving off praying? Yes, a hundred times twice told. And why didn't you? Because I believed that it was true which had been told me, 
That is, that without the righteousness of this Christ, all the world could not save me. And therefore thought I with myself, if I leave off to pray, I shall die. And if I must die, as well here at the throne of grace, as at the flesh pots of Egypt. And then this thought came into my mind. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So I continued praying, until at last the Father showed me his Son. And how was he revealed to you? It happened on this wise. One day I was very sad, I think sadder than at any time in my life. And this sadness was through a fresh sight of the greatness and vileness of my sins. And as I was then looking for nothing but death and the everlasting loss of my soul, suddenly, as I thought, I saw the Lord Jesus look down from heaven upon me and say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Lord, I am a great, a very great sinner. My grace is sufficient for thee. But Lord, what is believing? He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Then are believing and coming all the same? Any who come, reaching out the heart and affections after me, are believers in verity. Then am I truly a believer in Christ? Thou art. Then the water stood in my eyes. But I asked further, but Lord, may such a great sinner as I am be indeed accepted of Thee and be saved by Thee. He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. But Lord, what must I believe of Thee in my coming to Thee, that my faith may be placed aright upon Thee? Chiefly this, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners such as you, that he bestows righteousness to everyone that believes, that he died for your sins and rose again for your justification. He loved you and washed you from your sins in his own blood. He is mediator between you and your God, and he ever liveth to make intercession for you. From all of this I gathered that I must look for righteousness in his person and for satisfaction for my sin as by his blood, that what he did in obedience to his Father's law and in submitting to the penalty thereof was not for himself but for me. Blessed revelation! Ay, blessed indeed! And now was my heart full of joy, mine eyes full of tears and mine affections running over with love to the name, people, and ways of Jesus Christ. This was a revelation of Christ to your soul indeed. But tell me, particularly what effect this had upon your spirit? It made me see that all the world, notwithstanding all the righteousness thereof, is in a state of condemnation. It made me see that God the Father, though he be just, can justify the coming sinner. It made me greatly ashamed of the vileness of my former life and confounded me with the sense of my own ignorance. For there never came a thought into my heart before now that showed me so much the beauty of Jesus Christ. It made me love a holy life and long to do something for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus. Yea, I thought that had I now a thousand gallons of blood in my body, I could spill it all for the sake of the Lord Jesus. I saw then in my dream that Hopeful looked back and saw ignorance whom they had left behind coming after. Look how far yonder youngster loitereth behind. Aye, I see him, but I trow that he careth not for our company. But I'm sure that it would not have hurt him had he kept pace with us hitherto. That is true, but I wager that he thinks otherwise. That I trow he doth. But however, let us tarry for him. Come, lad, we wait your company. Greetings, sirs. How do you do? Very well, thank you. Why do you tarry so far behind? I take my pleasure in walking alone, thank you. I told you he cared not for our company. 
But let us see if we can bring him to his senses. Aye, let's. Pray tell, lad. How stands it between God and your soul now? I hope well, for I am always full of good feelings that come into my mind to comfort me as I walk. What good feelings? Pray tell us. Why, I think of God and heaven. So do the devils and damned souls. But I think of them and desire them. So do many that are never like to come there. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. But I think of them and leave all for them. That I doubt, for leaving of all is a very hard matter. Yea, a harder matter than many are aware of. Tis true, I have. What makes you think so? My heart tells me so. The wise man says he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. This is spoken of an evil heart, but mine is a good one. But how dost thou prove that? It comforts me in the hopes of heaven. That may be through its deceitfulness. For a man's heart may minister comfort to him by hoping for things to which it has no right. But my heart and my life are in harmony, and therefore my hope is well grounded. Who told thee so? My heart tells me so. Thy heart tells thee so? Dear friend, except the word of God beareth witness in this matter, other testimony is of no value. But is it not a good heart that hath good thoughts? And is not that a good life that is according to God's commandments? Yes, but it is one thing to have these things and quite another to only think you do. All right, all right then. Since you are wise so overmuch, do tell. What count you as good thoughts and a life according to God's commandments? Well, there be several kinds of thoughts. Some about ourselves, some of God, some of Christ, and some others. Tell me then, what be good thoughts about ourselves? Such thoughts as agree with the word of God. And when do our thoughts agree with the word of God? When we pass the same judgment upon ourselves which the word passes. Explain thyself. The word of God saith of the natural man, There is none righteous, there is none that doeth good. It saith also that every imagination of the heart of man is only evil, and that continually. Now then, when we think thus of ourselves, then are our thoughts good ones, because they agree with the word of God. I will never believe that my heart is so bad as all that. Therefore thou hast never had one good thought about thyself. Nonsense! But let us talk about my life. At least my life is honorable. The word of God saith that man's ways are crooked ways, not good, but perverse. Now when a man with humility doth agree with this, then his thoughts about his life are good, because they agree with the word of God. Bah! You look overmuch on the musty side of life. Not so. We but look at ourselves as we really are, wicked, perverse, selfish and disobedient. And when we see ourselves as such, then are we in a way to ask Christ to change us into his glorious image, as he has promised to do. And then our life and thoughts are full of the joy of Christ, as he himself hath said, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Enough of that, enough of that. Tell me, what are good thoughts concerning God? Again, those that agree with the word of God. Which? When we think that he knows us better than we know ourselves, and can see sin in us where we can see none. When we think he knows our inmost thoughts, and that our heart, with all its depths, is always open unto his eyes. Also, when we think that our own righteousness stinks in his nostrils, even in our best performances. Do you think that I am such a fool as to think that God can see no further than I? Or that I would dare to come to God in the best of my performances? Why then, how dost thou think in this matter? Why, I think I must believe in Christ for justification. But how can you believe in him when you have such a high opinion of yourself? Why, that you feel no need of his justification? I just believe, that's all. But how dost thou believe? I believe that Christ died for sinners, and that Christ takes my religious duties and makes them acceptable to his Father, by virtue of his merits, and so shall I be justified. Do you verily believe that? 
Yea, in verity. Then let me answer you in four parts. First, thou believest with a fantastical faith, for this faith is nowhere described in the word. Second, thou believest with a false faith, because it taketh justification from the personal righteousness of Christ and applies it to thine own. Third, this faith maketh not Christ a justifier of thy person, but of thy actions, and of thy person for thy actions' sake, which is false. Therefore this faith is deceitful, and will leave thee under the wrath of God in the day of judgment. What? Would you have us to trust to what Christ in his own person has done without us? or our own works of no account? No, such a belief would allow a man to give free rein to all manner of lust, since his own acts have no bearing on his salvation. Ignorance is thy name, and as thy name is, so art thou. For thou art ignorant of the true effects of saving faith, which doth lead a man to love God's name, his word, his ways, and his people. One with such a love will do none but good acts. Pray tell, lad, have you ever had Christ revealed to you? What? Revelations now? You and all you believe be the fruit of distracted brains. Not so, friend. Christ is so far above our natural thoughts that he cannot be known unless God the Father reveals him to us. Bah! That is your faith, not mine, and my faith is just as good as yours, though I have not in my head so many technicalities and legalities as you do. Friend Ignorance, not only must Christ be revealed to you as a gift, but your very faith must come to you as a gift. I see that you are ignorant of true faith, and I counsel thee to be awakened to see thine own wretchedness, and fly to Christ Jesus for salvation. Nay, but you two travel too fast for me. I shall go along at my own good speed and my own good faith, and I'll wager that I'll get to the kingdom not far behind thee. Thou must flee to Christ, or thou shalt never come to said kingdom. Perhaps so, perhaps no. We shall see who is right by and by. Fare thee well, gentlemen. I trust to see thee in the kingdom. If you do, it will only be because thou hast mended thy thinking. My heart tells me that there be no mending to be done. And now, adieu. Come along, my good hopeful. I perceive that thou and I must walk by ourselves again. Aye. Ah, oh, it pities me much for that poor man. It will certainly go ill with him at last. Alas, there are multitudes in our town in his very condition. Whole families, yea, whole streets, and that of pilgrims, too. Do tell, what do you think of such men? How do you mean? Do you think they ever have true convictions of sin, and so fear that their state is dangerous? Ah, best for you to answer your own question on that one, since you are the elder of us. Then I say that at times they may have deep convictions of sin, but, being naturally ignorant, they understand not that such convictions tend to their good. Therefore they do desperately seek to stifle them, and presumptuously continue to flatter themselves with the thought that all is well with their souls. But what makes them think so? Their heart tells them so. Ah, but doth not fear tend to man's good? Doth it not tend to help put their hearts right at the very beginning of their pilgrimage? Aye, right fear doth. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How may we know right fear? By three things. Namely? By its origins. Godly fear is caused by saving convictions of sin and deep feelings of one's lost and undone condition. Ah, yes. And? And by its actions. For godly fear doth drive the convicted sinner to lay fast hold of Christ for salvation. And third? And thirdly, by its fruits, in that godly fear begetteth and maintaineth in the soul a great reverence for God, his word and ways, it keeps the soul tender, and makes it afraid to turn to the right hand or to the left, toward anything that may dishonor God, grieve the spirit, or give the enemy occasion to accuse us. Well said, brother, and therefore godly fear is much to be coveted, even though for a time we are in distress. Aye, 
Twas thus with a heavy burden that I began my pilgrimage. Are we now almost got past the enchanted ground? Why? Art thou weary of our conversation? No, no, not at all. But I am curious to know where we be. We have only a couple more miles to travel. Ah, good. But now, do go on. What happens to the ignorant when they meet with conviction of sin? It arouses fear in them, as it did with us. And what do they with said fear? They know not that such convictions are for their own good to drive them to Christ. Therefore they seek to stifle them. How? Namely, in four ways. First, they think that these convictions from God are actually from the devil. Therefore they do resist them as evil temptations. Ah. Secondly, they think that the fears aroused are a denial of their faith, though they actually have none at all. And therefore they harden their hearts against them. A dangerous course. It would seem they do resist the spirit. Indeed, although they think they be resisting the devil. How else? Thirdly, such persons imagine that to have such fears is a denial of faith, and therefore ignore them and behave with presumptuous confidence. Ah. And lastly, they see that such fears tend to take away from them their pitiful old self-righteousness, and therefore they resist them with all their might. I can attest to the correctness of your thinking from my own experience. For before I knew myself, it was just so with me. And so it is with ignorance and his kin, and that likely to their destruction. But come, let us leave off discussing ignorance for a time, and study another profitable question. You begin it. Tell me, did you happen to know about ten years ago, a man named Temporary, as I recall, he lived in your parts and was very religious. Ah, uh, yes, I knew him well. He dwelt next door to a man named Turnabout in the town of Graceless. Their town lay about two miles off of the town of Honesty. Yes, that is exactly the man I had in mind. What about him? Well, if I be not mistaken, that man is an example of one who was once much awakened to the sight of his sins and to the wages due thereto. Ah, right you are, for he would oft times come to me, and that with many tears. I truly had pity for him, and for a time I thought him a likely candidate for the kingdom. But it is not everyone that crieth, Lord, Lord, that entereth in. He came to be very close to me, and once mentioned that he was resolved with all of his heart to go on pilgrimage. Then what? Then he grew acquainted with one save self, and from then on he made himself a stranger to me. And to me. But do tell, what think you to be the reasons for such sudden backslidings as his? I think yourself may rightly answer this one. You go on. Well, I think there be four reasons for it. Being? First off, that their hearts are not made new. Their consciences may be for a time aroused to fear the judgment and for a time they may put away their evil deeds. But in their hearts, they still long for the flesh pots of Egypt. And when the restraint of fear doth wear off, they once again follow their heart's desire. Well said. What be the second? The second reason is that they retain their fear of men. And as the word saith, the fear of men bringeth a snare. So for a time their fear of punishment doth lead them hot for heaven and to the ignoring of the opinions and oppositions of men. But as fears of the future grow cool, they begin to take a mind to what people may think of them and begin to believe worldly counsel, such as that which saith not to put all of your eggs in one basket. They try to live in two worlds, and so, being divided, find that they cannot serve two masters. And generally Christ suffers the loss of them rather than the world. Aye. What be the third reason for backsliding? The pride of the human heart. Being naturally proud and haughty, the natural heart looks down upon religion as being low and contemptible. Therefore, as they take their eyes off of the meek and lowly Jesus and forget his example, they find humility to be a stumbling block and return again to their former course. Ah, and so I have seen it. The pride of the natural heart is too wide to fit into the straight and narrow way. And what be the fourth reason? The thoughts of a judgment 
and a punishment to follow are grievous to them. So, rather than take note of those things which are surely to come, they choose rather to ignore them. They secretly hope that by choosing not to think upon these things, they will effectually prevent them from happening. And thus it is that they choose to harden their hearts, and this leads to a life of backsliding. I perceive your understanding to be clear, for truly the bottom of the whole matter is that the heart is not yielded to the control of the Holy Ghost, that they seek not first the kingdom of God, and that therefore they retain still an unchanged heart and mind. So it seems to me. Many seem to come to Christ out of fear of punishment rather than for love for what he has done for them. Aye, they are like the prisoner that standeth before the judge. He quakes and trembles, and seems to repent most heartily. But the bottom of all this is the fear of the gallows, rather than true sorrow for his deeds. Therefore, when he is released, we find that he is a thief still. Sad, but true. But come, now that I have showed you the reasons for backsliding, do show me the steps that men take in doing so. So I will, and that gladly. First, they choose to put their thoughts on things other than God, His law, and the judgment to come. Because such things are not agreeable to the natural heart. Aye. Secondly, they gradually give up their inner spiritual duties, such as secret prayer, controlling their lusts, vigilant watching, repentance, and the like. Because such things are burdensome to him who has taken his thoughts off of Christ. Aye. Thirdly, they shun the company of lively and hot Christians. Because they remind them that they themselves are lukewarm. Aye. Fourthly, they begin to grow cold to public spiritual duties, such as church and prayer meetings, where God's word is read and his praise is sung. Because their thoughts and hearts are out of place there. Aye. Fifthly, they begin to perceive specks of dust in the eyes of the godly. For why? Because this enables them to be blind to the beams in their own eyes and gives them a reason to throw all religion to the wind. Ah, well said. And sixth? Next, they begin to spend time in company with loose and wanton persons. And I can guess the seventh step. Go on. They begin to enjoy carnal conversation and enjoy the contemplation of sin. Exactly. And they rejoice if they can find any evil in one who is counted honest. That they may the more boldly follow their example. Aye. The eighth step is that they begin to play with little sins openly. And what can prevent their hearts from becoming hardened and casting off all pretense of goodness? Nothing. That is the ninth step. And unless there be some miracle of grace to prevent it, they shall utterly perish in their chosen deceptions. Now I saw in my dream that by this time the pilgrims were got over the enchanted ground, and entering into the country of Beulah, whose air was very sweet and pleasant, the way lying directly through it, they solaced themselves there for a season. Yea, here they heard continually the singing of birds, and saw every day the flowers appear on the earth and heard the voice of the turtle in the land. In this country the sun shineth night and day. Wherefore this was beyond the valley of the shadow of death, and also out of the reach of giant despair. Neither could they from this place so much as see Doubting Castle. Here they were within sight of the city they were going to, also here met them some of the inhabitants thereof. For in this land the Shining Ones commonly walked, because it was upon the borders of heaven. In this land also the contract between the bride and the bridegroom was renewed. Yea, here, as the bridegroom rejoiceth over his bride, so did their God rejoice over them, here they had no want of corn and wine, for in this place they met with abundance of what they had sought for in all their pilgrimage. Here they heard voices from out of the city, loud voices saying, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, 
Behold, thy salvation cometh. His reward is with him. Here all the inhabitants of the country called them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Now as they walked in this land, they had more rejoicing than in parts more remote from the kingdom to which they were bound. And drawing near to the city, they had yet a more perfect view thereof. It was builded of pearls and precious stones, also the streets thereof were paved with gold, so that by reason of the natural glory of the city and the reflection of the sunbeams upon it, Christian with desire fell sick. Hopeful also had a fit or two of the same disease. Wherefore here they lay by it a while, crying out because of their pangs. Oh, if you see my beloved... Tell him that I am sick by reason of my desire for the better land. But being a little strengthened and better able to bear their sickness, they walked on their way and came yet nearer and nearer, where were orchards, vineyards, and gardens, and their gates opened into the highway. Now, as they came up to these places, behold, the gardener stood in the way, to whom the pilgrim said, Good sir, pray tell whose goodly vineyards and gardens are these? They are the king's, and are planted here for his own delight, and also for the solace of pilgrims. Come in, and refresh yourselves with its dainties. Why, thank you. Thank you very much. Tis a pleasant task you have, sir working for the refreshment of weary pilgrims. Ah, tis a blessing that the king hath graciously bestowed upon me. I do hope you can pause for a time and explore all the walkways and arbors and rest in its pleasant pastures. Now I beheld in my dream that they talked more in their sleep at this time than ever they did in all their journey. And as I was in a puzzle trying to discover the reason thereof, the gardener did address me thus. I see thee to be puzzled. You see, it is the nature of the fruit of these vineyards to go down so sweetly as to cause the lips of them that are asleep to speak out the praises of the King of Glory. So I saw, when they awoke, they addressed themselves to go up to the city. But as I said, the reflection of the sun upon the city was so extremely glorious, for the city was pure gold, that they could not as yet with open face behold it, but only dimly through darkening glass made for that purpose. So I saw that as they went on, there met them two men in raiment that shone like gold, also their faces shone as the light. These men asked the pilgrims whence they came, and they told them. They also asked them where they had lodged, what difficulties and dangers, what comforts and pleasures they had met in the way, and they told them. Then said the men that met them, you have but two difficulties more to meet with, and then you are in the city. Good sirs, would you be so kind as to accompany us and guide our feet in straight paths? But of course. But you must obtain the city by your own faith, not ours. Thus it has been all along. Come, hopeful, let us be off. So I saw in my dream that they went on together till they came in sight of the gate. Now I further saw that betwixt them and the gate was a river. But there was no bridge to go over, and the river was very deep. At the sight thereof, the pilgrims were much stunned. Oh no! Such a river as I never saw! So deep and so wide! And we cannot come at the gate! except that we can get over it. That is correct. You must go through or you cannot come at the far side. Is there no other way to the gate? Ah, oh, yes. 
to be sure. But there hath not any, save Enoch and Elijah, been permitted to tread that special path since the foundation of the world. Nor shall any more tread it till the 144,000 shall meet the Lord in the air, and evermore be with the Lord. The pilgrims then, especially Christian, began to despond in his mind, and looked this way and that. But no way could be found by them by which they might escape the river. Oh, woe is me! Woe is me! Be not faithless, but believing. Sir, is the river so deep all the way across? We cannot say. Why not? Do you not know? We do not know. Why not? According to your faith, so shall it be unto you. What meaneth that? It means that you shall find the river deep or shallow as you believe in the king of the place. Well then, Brother Hopeful, since the Lord of the city hath promised that according to our days, so shall our strength be, let us pray for strength to cross this river. And so they prayed for courage and then entered the water. Christian began right off to sink and cried out, Oh, Hopeful, I sink in deep waters. The billows go over my head. All his waves go over me. Be of good cheer, my brother. I feel the bottom, and it is good. Oh, my friend, the sorrows of death have compassed me about. I shall not see the land that flows with milk and honey. And with that, a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian, so that he could not see before him. Also here, he, in a great measure, lost his memory, so that he could neither recall nor intelligently talk of any of those sweet refreshments that he had met with in the way of his pilgrimage. Oh, you dead man, Christian. Oh, woe is me. I fear that I shall die in this river and never get me in at the gate. Courage, brother. He will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able to bear. Your sins, Christian. Remember the sins of thy youth. Foolish jesting. Lustful thoughts. Wasted time. But my sins do rise up before me and sap me of courage. Oh, wicked man that I am. Be not afraid, brother. For your sins have gone up beforehand to the sanctuary where our high priest doth minister in our behalf. If they be come to thy mind, it is because Satan doth seek to bring upon thee Jacob's trouble. He doth minister for they that be good, Christian, not for thee. But I see ghosts and hobgoblins and evil spirits. Back! Get thee back! I am no longer thine! Yea, but thou art and evermore shall be down under with you. Help! Hopeful, therefore, here had much ado to keep his brother's head above water. Yea, sometimes he would be quite gone down, and then, ere a while, he would rise up again, half dead. Brother, I be sinking down. Thou be dying, Christian, dying without hope of life. I feel the seaweeds about my head. The pangs of death do devour me. Here, brother, get thee up. Here ye be. Plant thy foot on this solid rock. Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Nay, put thy whole weight on this rock. I perceive that it be a chief cornerstone. Do you feel it? Yes. Now only look. I see closely by us the gate and men standing by with hands outstretched to receive us. Only be not faithless, but believing. Not for thee. No, not for me. Yes, for you. Tis for you they went. You have been hopeful ever since I knew you. And so have you, my brother. Nay, you are but a sinner. Nay. For surely if I were right with God, he would now arise to help me. 
But because of my sins, he hath brought me into this snare and hath left me. My brother, you have quite forgot where it saith of the wicked. There are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. And how doth that help me? Do you not see? These troubles and distresses that you go through in these waters are no sign that God hath forsaken you, but are sent to try you, whether you will call to mind that which hitherto you have received of his goodness, and live upon his naked promises in this thy distress. Could it be? Could it truly be? No, not so. It is even so. And in his name I bid the evil spirit to be gone. And to thee, dear Christian, be of good cheer. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Oh, oh my! What is it, my brother? Oh, I can see him again. He speaks to me of faith, hope, and courage. He saith unto me, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Then be strong, be of good courage. Yes, yes, I shall. I do thank thee, dear brother. Without thy help, my faith had like to fail me. Then they both took courage, and the enemy was, after that, as still as a stone, until they were gone over. Christian, therefore, did firmly anchor his feet to the solid rock, And from that moment, the rest of the river did grow the more and more shallow. Thus, they got them over. Now, upon the bank of the river, on the other side, they saw the two shining men again, who there waited for them. Wherefore, being come out of the river, they saluted them. Greetings, faithful pilgrims. Do not I know thee? Aye, we be your ministering spirits, sent forth to minister to you that shall be heirs of salvation. Thus they went along towards the gate. Now you must note that the city stood upon a mighty hill, but the pilgrims went up that hill with bounding ease because they had these two men to lead them up by the arms. Also they had left their mortal garments behind them in the river. For though they went in with them, they came out without them. They therefore went up here with much agility and speed, though the foundation upon which the city was framed was higher than the clouds. They therefore went up through the regions of the air, sweetly talking as they went, being comforted because they had safely got over the river and had such glorious companions to attend them. Dear ministering spirits, as we ascend the hill of the Lord, do tell us of the glory of that place. Ah, the beauty is greater than words can tell. There is Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. And to think we be almost there. Ah, you are going now to the paradise of God, wherein you shall see the tree of life and eat of the never-fading fruits thereof. And when you come there, you shall have white robes given you, and your walk and talk shall be every day with the king, even all the days of eternity. Can it be? Can it truly be? Yea, verily so. And there you shall not see again such things as you saw when you were in the lower region upon the earth, to wit, sorrow, sickness, affliction, and death. For the former things are passed away. A glorious heritage, long dreamed of, long seen by faith, but now, now the faith has become sight. You are going now to meet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, men that God hath taken away from the evil to come, and that are now resting from their works, each one walking in the gift of Christ's righteousness. 
And what shall we do in this holy place? You will there receive the comfort of all your toil and have joy for all your sorrow. You shall reap what you have sown, even the fruit of all your prayers and tears and suffering for the king by the way. In that place you shall wear crowns of gold and enjoy the perpetual sight and visions of the Holy One. For there you shall see him as he is. Ah, what can Tang say? There also you shall continue to serve in person with praise and shouting and thanksgiving him whom you began to serve by faith upon earth. There your eyes shall be delighted with seeing and your ears with hearing the pleasant voice of the Mighty One. There you shall enjoy your friends and know that there shall be never more a sad tear of farewell. There also you shall be clothed with glory and majesty in a white robe of purest linen, which is the righteousness of the saints, and be put into an equipage fit to ride out with a king of glory, when he shall travel with sound of trumpet in the clouds as upon the wings of the wind, you shall go with him. And when he shall sit upon the throne of judgment, you shall sit by him. Yea, and when he shall pass sentence upon all the workers of iniquity, let them be angels or men, you also have a voice in that judgment because they were his and your enemies. And so shall you ever be with the Lord. Now, while they were thus drawing towards the gate, behold, a company of the heavenly host came out to meet them, to whom it was said by the other two shining ones, These are the men that have loved our Lord when in the world, and that have left all for his holy name. And he hath sent us to fetch them, and we have brought them thus far on their desired journey, that they may go in and look their Redeemer in the face with joy. Then the heavenly host gave a great shout, saying, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There came out also at this time to meet them several of the king's trumpeters, clothed in white and shining raiment, who with melodious noises and loud made even the heavens to echo with their sound. These trumpeters saluted Christian and his fellow with ten thousand welcomes, and this they did with shouting and sound of trumpet. This done, they compassed them round on every side. Some went before, some behind, some on the right hand and some on the left, continually sounding as they went with melodious noise in notes on high, so that the very sight was to them that could behold it as if heaven itself was come down to meet them. Thus, therefore, they walked on together. And as they walked ever and anon, these trumpeters, even with joyful sound, would by mixing their music with looks and gestures, still signify to Christian and his brother how welcome they were into their company, and with what gladness they came to meet them. And now were these two men, as it were, in heaven before they came at it, being swallowed with the sight of angels and with hearing of their melodious notes. Here also they had the city itself in view, and thought they heard all the bells therein to ring, and welcomed them thereto. But above all, the warm and joyful thoughts that they had about their own dwelling there, and with such company, and that for ever and ever. Oh, by what tongue or pen can their glorious joy be expressed? And thus they came up to the gate. Now, when they were come up to the gate, there was written over it in letters of gold, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then I saw in my dream that the shining men bid them call at the gate, the which they did. 
Then some from above looked over the gate, to wit, Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, to whom it was said, Hello! Greetings in the name of the king. What bring ye? Two pilgrims are come from the city of destruction for the love that they bear to the king of this place. Did they enter in at the wicket gate? Yea. Have they their certificates? Yea. Give them in at the door. And so the pilgrims gave in unto them each man his certificate, which they had received in the beginning. Those therefore were carried into the king, who, when he had read them, said, Where are the men who have left all for my sake? They are standing without the gate. Command that the gates be opened, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Now I saw in my dream that these two men went in at the gate, and lo, as they entered, they were transfigured, and they had raiment put on that shone like gold. There were also them that met them with harps and crowns, and gave them to them, the harps to praise withal, and the crowns in token of honor. Then I heard in my dream that all the bells in the city rang again for joy, and it was said unto them, Enter ye into the joy of your Lord. I also heard the men themselves, that they sang with a loud voice, saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now just as the gates were opened to let in the men, I looked in after them, and behold, the city shone like the sun. The streets also were paved with gold, and in them walked many men with crowns on their heads, palms in their hands, and golden harps to sing praises withal. There were also of them that had wings, and they answered one another without intermission, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And after that, they shut up the gates, which when I had seen, I wished myself among them. Now while I was gazing upon all these things, I turned my head to look back, and saw ignorance come up to the riverside. But he soon got over, and that without half the difficulty which the other two men met with. For it happened that there was then in that place one vain hope, a ferryman, that with his boat helped him over. So he, as the others I saw, did ascend the hill to come up to the gate. Only he came alone, neither did any man meet him with the least encouragement. When he was come up to the gate, he looked up to the writing that was above, and then began to knock, supposing that entrance should have been quickly administered to him. But he was asked by the men that looked over the top of the gate, Whence came you, and what would you have? I would enter in. What be thy name? My name be Ignorance. We have no notice that any by that name shall be coming here. Well, there, there must be some mistake. My heart tells me that heaven is my home. There are no mistakes made here. But I have ate and drank in the presence of the king. He is taught in our streets. Did you come in at the wicked gate? Oh, uh, a wicked gate? Did your walk come up in the straight and narrow path? Well, yes, it did seem quite straight and narrow to me. Yes, indeed. Have you your certificate that we may show it unto the king? Uh, I... one moment, please. Certificate. Certificate. What in the world are they talking about? Come, my good man, have you no certificate? Uh, I... So they told the king... My master, there waiteth one outside the door, who claimeth to be a follower of thine, 
but who hath no certificate. What be his name? His name be ignorance, master. Ignorance? Hmm, ignorance. I never knew any man by that name, nor he me. Though it grieve me, I must give sentence that he is not a subject of this kingdom. And so there came unto ignorance the two shining men that had conducted Christian and Hopeful to that place. Ah, ye are finally come. I am surprised at the rudeness of the place, for I had been standing without, lo, all these many minutes. Thinkest thou to gain entrance in at this gate? Yea. On what grounds? Why, uh, on the grounds that, uh... Show forth thine certificate. Uh... Uh, I have none. Why not? No man offered one to me. Every man that cometh through the way, the truth, and the life doth receive a certificate. Did you not come in at the wicked gate? Uh, I, uh... Know thee not that there can be only one way appointed by which men may be saved, and that those who enter in any other way be thieves and robbers? Uh, I... The king hath bidden me to tell thee that he knows thee not. He hath further commanded that thou be bound hand and foot, and cast into outer darkness. Bind this man. Nay, but I am a subject of this kingdom. No, stop! You tell your foolish king that he's made a mistake. I feel in my deepest heart that I am a subject of this kingdom. My feelings tell me so, do you hear? Carry him away for he is a stranger to this place. No, heaven is my home. I be a true pilgrim, for my heart tells me so. I feel in my innermost soul that I do belong in this place. This is my, get your hands off me, you. Let me go, I belong in Then they took him up and carried him through the air to the door that I saw in the side of the hill and put him in there. Then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the gates of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. So I awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Now, reader, I have told my dream to thee. See if thou canst interpret it to me, or to thyself or neighbor, but take heed of misinterpreting, for that, instead of doing good, will but thyself abuse. By misinterpreting, evil ensues. Take heed also that thou be not extreme in playing with the outside of my dream, nor let my figure or similitude put thee into a laughter or a feud. Leave this for boys and fools, but as for thee, do thou the substance of my matter see. Put by the curtains, look within my veil, turn up my metaphors and do not fail there if thou seekest them such things to find as will be helpful to an honest mind. What of my dross thou findest there be bold to throw away, but yet preserve the gold. What if my gold be wrapped up in ore? None throws away the apple for the core. But if thou shalt cast all away as vain, I know not but twill make me dream again. You have been listening to The Dramatized Pilgrim's Progress Produced by Orion's Gate and Friends Hello, this is Jim Pappas, your adapter and producer. I trust you have enjoyed what I believe to be the world's only fully dramatized recording of John Bunyan's immortal allegory. This production was narrated by the late Barbara Morton and the part of Christian was skillfully crafted by Mr. Kirk Van Buren. You may or may not be aware of the fact that, due to the astounding success of The Pilgrim's Progress, 
Mr. Bunning was impressed, or perhaps compelled by his reading audience, to write a sequel, which he entitled Christiana. You will be happy to learn that our production team has been hard at work and that all eight hours of Christiana are recorded and ready for your listening enjoyment. Since we have a bit of time remaining on this CD, my publishers and I thought we'd introduce you to selected scenes of our dramatized version of John Bunyan's wonderful sequel. We'll start out with the first half hour uninterrupted and then move into selected scenes from there. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a preview of Christiana, narrated by the late Elton Wallace and featuring Linda Pappas as the voice of Christiana. Ready? Good. Here we go. <laughs> 